Video games are art. A well-made game can evoke emotion, thought, and even action from those who play it. They are a symphony of writing, music, visuals, and interactive storytelling working in tandem with each other to engage with people in a way that no one of those mediums can do alone. They are greater than the sum of their parts. But there's a funny thing about art. Not every work is for everyone. When you talk about games as art, you'll usually be looking at two categories. Games with a high budget and aesthetic, usually consisting of the best of the best AAA games for their time. God of War, The Last of Us, Dark Souls, or Ghost of Tsushima. Or you'll be looking at games deliberately built as an art piece. Firewatch, Papers, Please, or The Stanley Parable. But I would say there's an often overlooked third category, and I would say it is best epitomized by a single game. This game inspired others, being directly cited as an inspiration to many indie game developers, including the devs for Terraria, FTL, Oxygen Not Included, and Minecraft. And when you consider that each of those games is critically acclaimed and has inspired others too, you realize the far-reaching cultural impact this game has had while likely not having played it yourself. Similarly, when on the topic of art, a natural next discussion to have about a piece is to wonder whether or not it is beautiful. Back in 2014, the headphone company Turtle Beach ran a public poll to find the gaming community's most beautiful game. The top 15 included many games most people will recognize. This list included Halo 3, The Last of Us, Borderlands 2, Skyrim, Far Cry 3, and The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker to name a few. I think anyone who's played those games would consider them all pretty compelling choices for most beautiful game. But above all, at number one, our mystery game stood. And that game is Slaves to Armok, God of Blood, Chapter 2. And I wouldn't blame you if you've never heard of this game, and that's because nobody calls it that. The name most people would recognize it by is simply Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress is somewhat infamous in the gaming community, being notorious both for its unwieldy interface and controls, and due to its sheer difficulty. Up until relatively recently, you couldn't even use your mouse. All controls were done via keybinds that were best used when memorized as to not rely on the clunky menus. Now you're more than likely thinking, how the hell did this, or even this, beat any of these other games on the list in a contest of beauty? And it's simple. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And Dwarf Fortress is an experience to anyone who can get into it. In fact, if Tarn had focused on graphics to any significant degree, he likely couldn't have made the game. And that's because under the rough exterior, the game is running an extensive simulation and procedural generation system. When you go to start a fortress, the first thing the game does is generate a history for the world you'll be playing in. Complete with civilizations of dwarves, elves, goblins, and everyone's favorite fantasy species, humans. And each of these will have royal lineages, wars, war heroes, pantheons of gods, economies, important artifacts, and horrific beasts that have plagued their progress. And the game even has a second way to play called Adventure Mode, where instead of building a colony of dwarves, you instead create a single character and explore that world, doing typical fantasy staples like quests or embarking on wars. You can even build a city in Fortress Mode and then go back and visit it in Adventure Mode. Or if you want the history neatly summed up, it even generates an encyclopedia of all these things that you can read up on. And as you play, your fortress and its citizens will get added to that history. And this is without even talking about the gameplay itself, which I think is unmatched in its detail. As Justin Ma, developer of Faster Than Light, puts it, Part of the reason Dwarf Fortress can include a breadth of mechanics unseen in other games is because complex mechanics are expressed in the most simple of visual forms. Everyone's try at the game will be different, and those who even get halfway decent at the game will have stories to tell. And they can range from intense situations to silly happenings. But this video isn't about Dwarf Fortress. This video is about a specific kind of game, of which Dwarf Fortress is just one example. This video is about what some would call story generators. If you looked up story generator, you probably wouldn't find anything relevant to what I'm talking about. Instead, you'll get things like narrative plot generators for writing. Story generators, in the context we're talking about today, don't really fit neatly into a single category or genre of game. They can be colony simulators like Dwarf Fortress or RimWorld, or they can be roguelikes. Or they can be 4X empire builders like the minigames Paradox has in their portfolio. Or they can be niche multiplayer games like Barotrauma or Space Station 13. But what I can say for certain is that these games aren't for everyone. They tend to be difficult, and often would be considered clunky by a mainstream audience. But what they like in a clean narrative and concise controls, they make up for in a breadth and depth you will not find anywhere else. They are to books as most games are to movies. Pathfinder 1st Edition to Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. They take the training wheels off and say, go nuts, kid. And this is precisely why they aren't the thing everyone plays. Where you're normally given clear direction and purpose, you instead need to figure out what to do. 
Instead of the steady pacing of a narrative structure with its highs and lows, you're given obstacles to overcome, and the story is instead your success, or more likely your failures, as you try to traverse those obstacles, and if you did fail, how you went about recovering from the disaster that just happened. I considered playing Dwarf Fortress to give you guys an example of my own experience just for this video, as the game recently went through some major updates as well as finally getting a release on Steam. However, it's been years since I've touched the game, so I would need to do a lot of relearning very quickly to get back into it. I also considered playing Space Station 13, which has some of the zaniest multiplayer interactions of any game ever. But same situation, I've not touched that game in years, and even when I did play it, I wasn't particularly good. Instead, I went for my old reliable, Stellaris. Stellaris, for those who don't know, is an empire-building strategy game in space. You build an alien culture and then play against computers or other players. Technically, there's a win condition to get the most points, but you can get those points in just about any way you can conceive. Founding colonies, researching new techs, having a big military, using your big military to take other people's colonies, and many more. And even if you don't end up as the winner, it's still fairly enjoyable just to see how your empire develops over time. The species I made for this run were the Ultur, naturally intelligent, traditional, short-lived fungus people. They are xenophilic, fanatic spiritualists looking to spread the good word of their subversive cult to the stars. They also have a quantum catapult, because I've never taken that origin and I wanted to see what it did. With my species created, the next thing I needed to do was create the galaxy I'd be playing in. I left most of the values as default, but apparently the last time I played, I had the difficulty set to Admiral for some reason. Major bonuses to economy, research, and naval capacity? Huh, I don't remember that. Let's tick that down to Commodore so those bonuses are only medium. My mushroom men were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at the prospect of getting to work. Early on, I have two main objectives. First is to expand my empire to natural choke points that are easier to defend from attackers. The second, as a megacorp, we're an empire that needs to build tall rather than wide. Once our borders are secure, we need to settle and develop every planet to the best of our ability. Naturally, as I'm not too interested in war this time, the game puts us next to multiple militaristic factions that wish to subjugate me. In fact, the first one I met instantly declared war to try and outright conquer me. It's a good thing I had identified a choke point and did an early station buildup to prevent that from happening. A bit of fighting later and we ended up settling a white piece so there's no change in territory. But as I started meeting and looking at my other neighbors, I began seeing a trend. Due to the difficulty I selected, just about everyone around me automatically outclasses me in everything. They both have more ships and better ships because they've boosted research, and more of all resources just given to them by the game. This meant I needed to pivot strategies. It would be literally impossible to win, so instead I needed to not lose. I befriended two of my neighbors and entered defensive packs with them. This meant if someone declared war on me, they would be pulled into the war for my protection. My naval strategy shifted from build a bigger gun to defense in depth pretty quickly for this reason. I outright couldn't take a one-on-one -on -one fight from anyone, so instead I needed to simply buy time for my allies to arrive. To my luck, these neighbors ended up being powerhouses for the entire length of the game, which kept me from getting wiped off the face of the map multiple times. My big limiter in developing my defenses and fixing the quantum catapult was alloy production. Alloys are used to build spaceships and space stations, and being so small, I had a very limited production of them compared to my need. So, how did I fix this? Well, I sold my soul to the devil. Kinda. Sorta. Not really. I went to my neighbors, allied or otherwise, and traded favors to them in exchange for monthly alloys. Favors are essentially an IOU, letting you trade long-term diplomatic power for short-term material gain. They're used to garner support for or against laws proposed by the galactic community, essentially the UN in space. As small as I am, I figured I'd have limited sway anyway, so instead I picked up over 300 alloys per month to cover my construction needs. To sure up my production of energy credits, also known as Space Bitcoin, I began employing one of my favorite strategies in these kinds of games, wheeling and dealing to get more money than God. As a megacorp, you can establish trade deals with other empires to open offices on their planets. You invest resources into their planets, and depending on the size and condition of that planet, will get money in return. Because the Ultur are a subversive cult, meaning they have a criminal heritage background, the other empire does not need to consent to this. I set up shop on the most profitable planets I could find, and went to work building smuggling ports, pirate havens, subversive shrines, and front companies. This netted me a few thousand energy credits per month, so any other resource I ran short on, I simply bought to cover the deficit. This also had the benefit of getting me the second biggest economy early on. The largest was eventually wiped out by another empire, so market control transferred to me, giving me a reduced fee for buying resources from the market. With my criminal enterprises spread far and wide, the next thing I needed to do was cover my research deficit. I found early on one thing the computers didn't really know how to deal with was espionage, so I spent influence to steal technologies from them as quickly as possible. Neither their code breaking nor encryption were particularly 
really strong, so it was fairly easy to do. Eventually, they teched up and made it more difficult, but this just meant I could steal those texts from them and make up the difference. Once I got into psionics and my mushroom men literally became mind readers, they couldn't stop me from spying on them because they couldn't tell they were being spied on in the first place. My influence production was pretty low in the mid-game due to my defensive packs, so in between espionage attempts I began communing with the Shroud, an eldritch being which gives you random boons or detriments for dropping by and saying hi every now and then. Sometimes these detriments can be a hostile avatar of the Shroud spawning somewhere in your borders, meaning Cthulhu just decided to try and ruin my day. But that's okay, my neighbors decided to help me out with that one. Over time, my influence production increased between edicts, traditions, and joining a federation. I ended up at a pretty healthy 9 influence per month, letting me rotate through everyone on the map to steal tech from fairly quickly. Speaking of the Federation, I originally didn't want to join it. My neighbor to the north started it as a hegemony, so if I were to join it, it'd benefit him more than it benefited me because I'd likely never be able to leave it. Then my neighbor to the south joined it. I may have been allied to both of them, but they were the two powerhouses I mentioned earlier, so it was in my best interest to keep them pitted against each other to prevent them from getting any funny ideas and splitting me down the middle. They accepted me into the Federation with open arms as their ally, and then gave me free intel on everyone else in the Federation. I used this to further spread my criminal empire to their most profitable planets. I also prevented them from declaring war multiple times to subjugate other empires, because it required unanimous vote, so my single no stopped the entire war machine. I was also able to propose a couple popular laws, such as free migration packs for Federation members, which the leader was one of the few against the idea. Eventually my northern neighbor got fed up with me and left the Federation they started, my neighbor to the south taking their spot as the next largest empire. Eventually I hit a cap in how tall I could build. No new planets to colonize, no good expansion sites this late in the game. My best bet was to get mega engineering. Aside from political shenanigans to try tearing others down, my mid to late game was fairly stagnant. Despite basically everyone building mega engineering projects at this point due to their accelerated research, I just couldn't seem to nab the tech from them for the longest time. Eventually I got it and got to work. I built a science nexus first to shore up my research, making any further mega engineering projects that much quicker to achieve. Through research and edicts, I also sped up the pace they could be built at. Next I built a Dyson Sphere and a Matter Decompressor, meaning I wouldn't need to worry about minerals or energy ever again. I took the Ascension perk to allow me to build ring worlds. If I didn't have the planets to settle, I'd just build them instead. Once I got two of them fully finished, I began alternating between building a third ring and other projects, like a mega shipyard and a strategic coordination center. This got me to a point where resources were no longer an issue, and I could more realistically handle a brawl with my smaller neighbors. Somehow I discovered the Ultima Vigilist system, which nobody else tried getting to. I assume because I was the only one using jump drives. I moved to the far edge of the galaxy with my army and jumped in to claim the system for myself. One fight later, and it was mine. I moved in science and construction ships to survey and claim the system, then began archaeology in the process of building a gate to easily get there. This also became the site for my fourth ring world. A couple fairly long and stagnant wars later, and we were in the final stretch until victory was called. At this point, I was higher on the leaderboard than I expected, so I decided to push as hard as I could. Basically, the only metric I could possibly go after and not be beat by the AI was my economy, so I transitioned to building as many trading outposts on my ring worlds as possible. However, just because I have the buildings doesn't mean I get the benefits if I don't have the population to work them. I distributed as many luxury goods as I could, asked edicts to try and get people from other empires to move in, and even turned to buying and then freeing slaves from the market. This did end up working to a degree, but the pace I was gaining population wasn't fast enough to possibly outpace those higher on the leaderboard. I called it a tad early with a respectable fifth place, which to be frank I can't be mad at considering I managed to wiggle my way past death multiple times. So, why did I just spend three days straight trying to get to the end of a game of Stellaris as fast as I could? To illustrate how these games go, no matter your expectation going into it, there's always a reliance on chance and emergent gameplay stemming from that chance. It's been a bit, but Subversive Cult has been my favorite government type since Megacorps were put into the game. And despite being familiar with how they play, a single mistake of mine before the game even started threw the entire run onto a path I was woefully underprepared for. I had to whip out every trick I could think of to prevent an untimely demise, and succeeded despite the game actively trying to kill me. Where I expected to be a Deep South pastor yelling to his congregation that he needed a new watch, I instead ended up as evil Space Switzerland, backstabbing bastards who will fleece you of your money and technologies without your knowledge because they can literally read your mind. Defense and depth experts who do their best to stay neutral, and to achieve this neutrality do their best to pit everyone else against each other. Builder of the majority of the Halo array, complete with an extra galactic arc to retreat to if needed, even if it would be extremely annoying to live there. This is a story that's entirely unique to me and to this playthrough of the game. And this is a good illustration of what a story generator does. XCOM campaigns become more about the survival of your troops than the narrative of the game. Rimworld settlements become a roll of the dice as to what kind of messed up dystopia you can create. Paradox's other games let you rewrite history with a bunch of what-ifs. 
Space Station 13 lets you witness the horror as other players unleash a tidal wave of robots consisting of other people's severed asses that just move around and say butt. And Dwarf Fortress lets you witness the fall of your entire city because one guy got a little too sober and his cat died, pissing him off enough that he started fighting other dwarves in a cascading effect called a tantrum spiral, leading to the loss of the game and the abandonment of your fort. But that's okay, because losing is fun and you got your own little story out of it.